Welcome to Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries, dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching and teaching the word of God from the preserved and fallible King James Bible of 1611. Welcome to another installment of the Romans Expository Studies. In this study, we're going to be picking up in verse 8 of chapter 3. We left off in the previous study in verse 3 in chapter, um, verse 7 of chapter 3, and we'll be picking up in verse 8. So in, turn your King James Bible to Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and some affirm that we say, Let us do, do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. So you see right there, uh, Paul speaking that they're being accused of doing evil so good may come, essentially. And he says that those accusers who are accusing him of those types of things, their damnation is just, essentially. So these are lost people that are twisting what they're saying, essentially. So, and you'll find that. You will find that. There are people out there that will... You know, you'll try to preach the gospel to somebody and they'll immediately twist what you're saying. You know, they'll immediately try to twist and say, you're trying to tell me to, you know, uh, I'm going to hell and everything. It's like, yes, I am telling you that, but I'm also telling you how to get out. <laughs> I'm also telling you your sin is going to send you to hell, but there's a way out. You can receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what we, that's what we tell people when we preach the gospel. And people will try to sit there and misconstrue it twist it they'll say well you know you're just judging me you're judging me and everything it's um yes because your sin is going to send you to hell and god's going to judge you and when he judges you that's a final judgment so again this it, people will always try to twist what you say as a bible believer they really will because they don't want to actually deal with what what they're actually being told i'll go ahead and jump into verse nine what then are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before, before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So you see that the uh, the we would be the Jews in that in that verse right there, and that they it would be the Gentiles. Is what that's saying right there. And the idea being is that we're not better than anyone else. We're all under sin. You know, you're just talking to a saved sinner, and. When you go to witness to somebody, you're just trying to tell them how to get get out of hell, how to get how to be saved, how to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the free gift of salvation. You're just trying to tell them that. And when they sit here, I mean, there there are plenty of people that will actually make it out to be as if you're trying to say you're better than them. And that's the, uh, I mean, that's the truth. They'll say, well, what about you and your sins? You know, what about what about the things that you did? Yeah, that's why I repented. That's why I repented and came to the Lord as sinner, because I knew what was going on. I finally realized that my sin was destroying me both uh, carnally and eternally. Destroying my life here on this earth, the wicked things that people do. You know, for example, drug, drug addiction, um, fornication, all those types of things, they will destroy you on this earth when you continue in them. Drugs destroy your body. Fornication leads to disease and things like that. Uh, stealing leads to trouble with the law, and eventually you, you know, you wind up going to prison for a long, long time, maybe forever. There, I mean, crime, all those things, they're all negative, and they will come back and bite lost people. You know, if you're saved, they bit you in your lost life. I mean, we're not any better than anybody else. We're just saved sinners. That's the difference. Now, that being said, the Holy Spirit is our help, and we do have the Holy Spirit living within us, that gives us the help that we need in order to get sins out of our life. Sins that we're struggling with, sins that we want to get out just to just to honor God, just to try to really walk with Him. And we begin, the Holy Spirit begins convicting us of those sins, and we begin to sanctify our earthly lives in honor of God. Not to be saved or anything, not to earn salvation. No, you, you got that the moment that you trusted that gospel. But the idea being is living for Him, having a life that reflects Him in your life. You know, that's the idea. That's what sanctification is. You want to live for Jesus Christ. Gratitude out of love for what he did for you. I mean, and then also a good testimony among the lost world. You know, having a good testimony. Someone could say, hey, that guy right there, that guy's a Christian. And I know one thing, that man never told, uh, told me a lie in his life. 
That man never did me wrong in his life. He was always there, honorable, and things like that. A good testimony. Very important. But again, and there's also the whole thing of street preachers nowadays. There's a lot of street preachers out there that actually do videos, and they will openly say in their videos that they are not sinners anymore, that they are uh, they're saints. Now, yes, we are saints, but that doesn't mean that we're sinlessly perfect or we're not sinners. We're saved sinners. The idea that someone could actually willingly go up to a person on the street and street preach and say, well, you need to give up all your sins and be completely perfect, and if you don't, you're still going to go to hell no matter what you believe about the Lord. That's wickedness right there. And those types, that type of self-righteous, disgusting attitude, those men are probably not saved themselves. Because it doesn't sound like they actually trusted the gospel alone for salvation. It sounds to me like they wanted to believe in Jesus and then trusted in their own works, which is what we would call uh, lordship salvation, work salvation, all kinds of different terms for it. But it's the idea of that you, the trusting the gospel is not enough. You have to do something to save yourself. And that's where, that's, that's wickedness. That's where just... That's basically spitting on the gospel, is what that is. But yeah, there are a lot of street preachers out there nowadays that claim that they're not sinners to people on the street when they're street preaching to them. Which doesn't make any sense, considering what we just read here in this passage. They are all under sin. We are all under sin. When you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit to help you, to help you sanctify. But continuing here, verse 10. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Right there. I mean, immediately after what we just got done talking about, we Paul begins to break down self-righteousness. There is, um, as is written, there is none. There is none righteous, no, not one. As is written, is a reference to an Old Testament scripture, and the reference would actually be Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. So God, go to Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside, they are altogether become filthy, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. So you see right there, with the denial of God comes corruption and abominable works. People who deny God will just get will just continue in corruption and abominable abominable works. I mean, the lost don't seek God because they love their wickedness. They want to live in that perpetual sin. They don't want to see the the negative, the, all the wickedness and things that it's doing to them in their lost life. They want to just keep holding on to it because they they you know a lot of lost people think that that's all they have. A lot of lost people think that all they have in this world is the you know drugs and things like that, and they wanted that's that to them is their thrill and the only thing that they really feel like they live for and stuff. And it's there's more to life than just seeking out drugs and partying and all this stuff and all these wicked things or thieving and getting a thrill. People, a lot of people get this special little thrill about their sin. They feel like it's just some some sort of as they call it, the adrenaline rush or the adrenaline junkies. You know, some people just do it just for a kind of like a thrill, and it's wickedness. And the thing is, there is much more to this life serving the Lord than there is to living in perpetual sin. And then whenever they, can get, they get confronted with the Lord in hell, they, again, they get angry, they start misjudging you and start trying to accuse you rather than listen to what you're trying to tell them because they're prideful and they love their sin. But there's so much more. There's so much more if you get saved. You can... Get, get that sin out of your life. You can actually live for the Lord and enjoy the blessings that he gives you. It's just, there's much more to this life than what uh, the lost people out there seem to, uh, seem to think. And also the cross-reference for that, for them loving their wickedness, would be in John chapter 3 and verse 19.
John chapter 3 and verse 19. Again, if you're lost, this book really does, uh, really does show you and break down your self-righteousness. You have no right to be prideful about your sins or the type of things that you do, the lost life that you lead. There's no, there's no righteousness in it. There's nothing good that comes out of it. It's all negative. John chapter 3 and 19. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are were evil. Again, seeking God means that you have to turn from, you basically have to, not to, don't get this confused. Seeking God means that you have to turn from sin to God. Doesn't mean that you have to clean up your life or be completely sinlessly perfect. That's not what I'm saying. Let me clarify. You have to turn from that desire of sin to God. You have to finally realize what that sin is doing to you and turn yourself to God rather than sin and look to God for salvation. Come to him as a sinner. Put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your personal sins against him, and he will save you. Not cleaning up your life completely, and then he'll save you. Not doing any kind of works to earn your salvation. I mean simply looking at that sin, saying it's destroying me. I need God. That's repentance. You begin to feel sorrowful over those sins. You start, you start to realize that the direction you're going leads to nothing but death, misery, and destruction. And you turn and turn your face to, to God and you seek God and you put your faith in that death, burial, and resurrection for your personal sins against him and he saves you. That is technically would be called turning from sin to God. Not putting away all your sins and becoming sinlessly perfect to God uh, before you can come to God, but just turning from it. Realizing what it's doing, turning yourself to God. That's repentance. Not sinless perfection. By no means. You'll never be perfect. But the idea being is you're finally done with those sins. You're finally done with thieving, you know, going out and stealing from people. You're finally done with these drugs or whatever type of sin it is. Maybe it's fornication, covetousness, whatever all the different things that are out there that people look at and look to in their lives. You finally say, um, I'm done with this. I don't want this life anymore. I want God. It's a very beautiful thing when that happens. That's a very special moment. That's why testimonies are so beautiful and the fact that they really show you that point to where somebody realized, these sins are destroying me, and I have to turn myself to God now. I have to stop ignoring the truth of the Bible. I have to stop ignoring that God is real and he sees what I'm doing, and if I don't put my faith in him, if I don't put my faith in the gospel, then I will go to hell. It's finally coming to that perfect moment of pure desperation. Now go to, back to Romans. And verse 11. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. So you see, with all the false religion in the world... It's kind of an interesting passage, an interesting verse right there. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. Well, you see, the thing is, is that a lot of people would think that with all the false religion out there, people are seeking God. But actually, they're not. If they were, why don't they speak against other religions? I mean, if they were really, if these people in a lot of these organized religions were so adamant about finding the true God, why aren't they speaking against the other religions saying, hey, that's, there's no way that there's multiple paths to God, there should only be one. It only makes sense. It's only logical, it's only perfect to realize there's only one path to God, and someone's got to find it, if they're really seeking the Lord, which we know the only path is through Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, Jehovah saves. So, again, these people, they, they don't speak against other religions, they want to feel righteous, with their system of works, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. They're not seeking God. They all seek different things. They seek, uh, especially in Hinduism and Buddhism, nirvana, this state of perpetual peace, perpetual higher spiritual calling, whatever you want to call it. That's essentially what they say nirvana is, is this perpetual area of just 
perfection and contentment type, type of stuff. That's essentially what nirvana is described as in Buddhist um, culture. And the thing is, is that it's nirvana. So you're happy the rest of your life and then you die and you wind up going to hell. You know, nirvana, as they say, the perpetual state of happiness. That's not even seeking after God. They should be seeking after their creator, wanting to know who he is, what he came to do. But they're not, they're not doing that. They want to live in their system of works. They want to do all these weird things to try to prove themselves righteous to go to whatever idea of heaven that they have in their culture. Being a Christian, you don't have to prove anything. Being a Christian, you don't have to try to sit there and do all these amazing works or whatever to try to get to heaven. The Lord has made your destination fixed the moment that you put your faith in that gospel. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You can earn rewards in heaven for serving God on this earth. That's there. But the idea that the idea of being of you earning your salvation is completely foreign to the New Testament. So these people aren't seeking God. They just seek that they're they're just seeking their religion of good works. That's what they're seeking. And they're they're gonna fall flat on their face. Or should I say they're gonna fall flat into the lake of fire. You want self-righteousness? You can have it. I'll take the Lord's sacrifice for my sins. 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Again, lost people don't understand Scripture. They, they don't receive the things of the Spirit of God because they, uh, they don't have the Spirit of God abiding in them. So they don't understand Scripture. That's also kind of another reason why when you encounter a lost person on the street and things like that, you're trying to witness to them. Don't let them get you into a rabbit trail of going all over the Bible to explain this, 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 and this, and all these different right divisions that they want you to explain to them. Because what they're really trying to do is they're trying to get you off track. Rather than just focusing in on, hey, are you a sinner? Where do you think you're going to go when you die? I mean, you, that's, that's really what you need to preach to lost people. Don't let them get you off on a rabbit trail of all these different areas of Scripture to point out to them and try to explain to them. No, it's the gospel. Do you believe you're a sinner? Yes, then put your faith in the Lord. Why can't you do that? That's where it always has to be with lost people because they'll try to get you on rabbit trails. Now go back to, go down to verse 12 in Romans 3. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Everyone is a sinner. Not one person does, does good. Not one person is good enough to go to heaven. Not ever. The only one who did it was God himself in, in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, living as being born of a virgin, living as a man, living a perfect, sinless life, and dying on the cross for our personal sins against him. I mean, that, that is the truth right there. That's the only way. And, he, and the only person who ever lived sinless, which was Jesus Christ, is God the Father in a body. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's why he came down and did it for us. He earned salvation for us rather than us trying to do it on our own because we can't our flesh is too wicked it's too sinful it will fail we will fail but he will never fail us he is faithful amen amen and amen to that but that's why when you get these people out there well i'm a good person no you're not please quit trying to deceive yourself quit trying to think that you have all these great good works that are going to earn your earn your way into into heaven because the truth is the scale is always going to be tipped on the sinful side. I mean, you're never going to find yourself with enough good works to make it into heaven to outdo any kind of bad works. I mean, every time you have a wicked thought, that's that's sinful. How can you out how can you do outward good works to outweigh your sinful thoughts? Can't be done. You cannot earn your way into heaven. There is none that doeth good. None is righteous. 
and verse 13. Their throat is, is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Every wicked person lies, 100%. They, every single person has lied at least at one point in their life. And it also compares lost people's mouths to a graveyard, a sepulcher. I mean, uh, go to Psalm chapter 5 and verse 1. Psalm chapter 5 and verse 1. Verse, actually down to verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very, is very, is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. So you see right there, Paul is quoting, Paul is quoting that verse here in the, here in the New Testament like we just read in Romans. And the mouth is not faithful to say the things that God says. The mouth, uh, I mean, the mouth is compared to a lot of things. The mouth is also compared to, uh, see here, James chapter 3 and verse 6. James chapter 3 and verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire, and it is, and it is set on fire of hell. So you see right there, the tongue is compared to a world of iniquity. It's a fire. I mean, and so is the uh, the tongue of our, it, it defileth the whole body. It saith on fire the course of nature. That's pretty serious stuff being said about the tongue, the power of words, the power of the mouth. And that's the thing, too, is that, I mean, you're talking about the, the tongue here is, is so powerful. Keep in mind that, again, a lot of the wicked uh, figures of history, people like Hitler and things like that, and a lot of the, also those communist leaders that killed so many people, they did it just by simply talking and giving us insane speeches and all this crazy stuff. All they did was literally use their tongue to kill millions. I mean, that's the tongue is powerful and it is a world of iniquity. And wicked people, they will they use it for those for the, all those different wicked things. Like for example, like I just said, Hitler, other types of communist leaders and just warmongers. I mean, that's how powerful the tongue is. And again, the, the tongue is it's a very, if you, if you don't have control over it, it can be a very wicked thing. And back to Romans in, in verse 14. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Cursing and bitterness. Now, let, let me say this. That was back then, and it's also for today. I mean, cursing and bitterness, what are you seeing all over the place? I mean, anywhere you go publicly, uh, whether it's even something that on, on, I mean, a lot of television, all that stuff, it, there is cursing and bitterness. I mean, you, every single person out there nowadays is just letting cuss words fly every other sentence that they speak. There was a time where people were ashamed to say the, to say those cuss words here in American culture, where if somebody said it, said something like that in public, another person would look at them like, what did you just say? Not anymore. Not anymore in this culture. No, it's just pretty much, you know, whenever, whatever you want to say, just let it fly. Let your tongue go crazy and just blab, blab out wicked cuss words and be the open sepulcher that it is. You know, it's really, it's really something. I mean, I know I read a while back, there was some stupid article online saying that people who cuss have a higher IQ or they're smarter because they let cuss words out and all this dumb stuff. What a bunch of wicked garbage, really. 
I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous that the type of stuff that people out there write articles like that will try to go to justify cussing and cussing up a storm, especially in public. I mean, the tongue will, the tongue always slips for everybody, myself included, times where I struggle with things like that. But again, it's just this, this un, unrepentant, just cussing up a storm and everything like that, wicked lost people. I mean, their tongues really are worlds of iniquity. And if they were cussing like they were back then, according to what Paul's making it out here, I can only, I mean, it's the same thing now in, in this day and age. I mean, we have a, unfortunately, the, living in America, because that's where I live is America, this country went from an upstanding country that wouldn't even tolerate stuff like that out in public to now just, oh yeah, anything flies with us. Go ahead and, you know, let them, let them fly. I'll, I'll join in with you. That's how far this country's fallen. And that's how far the world is falling. So, with that being said, that's actually the end of this installment of the Roman series. And we will see you in the next installment. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you for watching Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries. James chapter 4 and verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The gospel is this. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Friend, you are not a good person. Romans chapter 3 verses 19 to 23. Now we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever lied, cheated, fornicated, or even killed? James 2 verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You have sinned against a perfect, holy God. The punishment for sin is eternal hell. Matthew chapter 5 verses 29 to 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Do you fear God? Are you sorry for your sins? Are you desperate for salvation? A new life? 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The Good News 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day for your personal sins against God, so that you can be justified. Romans 3 verse 24 Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 13 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. 
For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on the Lord, ask for the free gift, and receive the new birth today. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new.